who can fix your soul? The other day I saw a t-shirt. It said, I know things. I fix things. That's all. I thought about my dad. My dad was always the person for me that knew things and fixed things. He could fix anything. He used to restore antiques, a little bit like one of those guys from the repair shop, if you've ever seen that on TV. He loved that show. There wasn't much he couldn't fix. But what about your soul? Who, who can fix your soul? Who can fix you? That's what we're talking about, isn't it? When I, when I was young, there was a, a TV program we all used to watch because there was only like one TV channel. Uh, and it was called Jim Will Fix It. And Jim could fix anything. People would write to Jim with their, their problems, their questions, and Jim would fix it. And the problem is Jim had a problem of his own. He was a slave to various lusts and, and pleasures. Uh, and after he was dead, it all came out. And that never got fixed. He never, he never dealt with the problem that he had. There's actually a lot of people, aren't there, who, who give their lives to fixing other people. Psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, doctors, every, all sorts of people. Friends who like to go and sit in a restaurant and fix their other friends. But none of them can fix their own souls, can they? None of them actually can fix them. So, so who can fix you? Who, who is it that can actually fix your soul? And we all have a soul problem, don't we? Do you, do you agree with that? Are you, I guess you're in church, so you, you think you've got something of a soul problem. Or maybe you came here thinking that we were just going to kind of tell each other how good we were. Well, you came to the wrong church because we speak the truth. Um, it, it's not just notorious sinners like Jimmy Savile who have problems at the soul level, is it? It's not just notorious sinners like Jimmy Savile who are slaves to various lusts and pleasures. Enslaved, that's what it said here. Look, this is what we looked at last week, verse 3. For we ourselves also, also Paul, the apostle, Saint Paul, is including himself in his description and he's telling this to Christians. He's saying we ourselves also once were Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. I mean, that's a bad, bad state of affairs, isn't it? But actually, that is truth. And it's truth about your soul. Those are some of the features, as I tried to set it out for you last week, seven features of our fallen human condition that we're all like before we're saved. The, the theological term for it is total depravity. It doesn't mean you're as bad as you could be, but it means that there is this badness, this wretchedness about us at the very deepest level, permeating all areas of our life. And who can fix that kind of a mess. <laughs> Thank God um, that God can. Thank God for the word but. Did you notice the word but as I read Titus chapter 3 for you? And in verse 4 it begins. Just after that description, the, 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 the narrative continues with the word but. But when the kindness of and mercy, affection of God our Savior appeared and so on. The reason that we have a Bible today, the reason that we're here in church today is because there's a but there and it's not the end of the story. We're bad, that's true. But God saves bad people, that is wonderfully true. Praise God for it, that's the good news of the gospel. This is why we're here. God can fix you. Now, if you don't believe that, hopefully you're in for a treat today because I'm going to try and show you just how. This section from verses 4 to 7 is all about the fix. Jesus called it salvation. Uh, if you're taking notes in verses 4 to 7, I want to show you seven facts about salvation. This is, 
I, it, it wasn't me that planned this, but it's worked out really well. There were, um, in, in verses 1 and 2, there were uh, seven uh, things that we're supposed to be towards the authorities and rulers. In, verses, in verse 3, there were seven features of our fallen humanness. And in verses 4 to 7, there's seven facts about salvation. And I don't know if that's the way God planned it. But that's what's there as far as I can see, and uh, I'm just giving it to you as I, I find it. So seven facts about salvation to help you to help you so that you can know that God can save the worst of sinners. That's the point of this passage. If you were here for verses 1 and 2, you'll remember that in this whole section, what's going on is that ty- it, it, it it is, it, all, all that Paul is saying here is to help Titus to remind the Christians why they need to be subject to their rulers and authorities and so on. And in verse 3, the idea is that we're no different from them, so we can't look down on them. And in verses 4 to 7, it's all about our salvation. And the take-home message from this part in verses 4 to 7 is that God is able to save absolutely anybody. And that's good news, right? So in verses 4 to 7, we've got seven facts about salvation to help you to know that God can save the worst of sinners. And and that, I'm hoping, is going to encourage you to pray for them boldly. You're going to look at the worst people you know, the most despicable people you know, and, and actually pray for them with faith believing that God can save them, right? That, that would be a good thing. And I'm also hoping that if you're tempted, if you're here and you're tempted to think God wouldn't, God couldn't save you because you're the worst of sinners, I'm, I'm hoping you'll go away today with that view changed. Not that I'm going to say you're not the worst of sinners, but I am going to say God can fix it. So, are you with me? Seven facts about salvation. First fact is that salvation is God's initiative. God's initiative. Verse 4. Look, it says, But when, when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. It doesn't say when we evolved. It doesn't say that. And that's what people think, isn't it? Oh, human nature, well, you know, in the past we were primitive and barbaric and bad. But, you know, human nature's got better. Oh, yeah. I tried telling that to people in Ukraine at the moment. That's what they said, wasn't it? They, they said that before World War I. They said, oh, human nature. That, oh, this, this doctrine of total depravity is just old-fashioned primitive doctrine. Now we've got the doctrine of evolution and we understand that human nature is progressing. And then World War I happened. And then what did that dent our human pride in human nature? No, between World War I and World War II, we said now we've understood we've got a new philosophy that, that was the war to end all wars. That's what they called it. The war to end all wars because we've changed. Now what we need is education. Now what we need is better, better, um, better circumstances. So let's, you know, let's get a national health system and let's end poverty and let's end struggle in the homes because of course people have depravity because they're, they're in such deprived conditions they can't help it poor things let's give them better and they'll be better and the reality was world war ii and and, and yet you think things have improved after world war ii we've got the league of nations we've got the united nations we've got the new world order on its way Never thought you'd hear those words from this pulpit but i'm not buying into all the conspiracy theories i'm just saying it Okay, it looks like it's actually happening. Um, but it's... it's <laughs> so you've got the reality that, that people are trying to say, look, we, can just, we just need to organize things better. We just need to do... Th- we, it, we, all we have to do is fix climate change and all our problems will be over. And, uh, and then let's fix prejudice and, and, and we'll be through this. And, 
Um, but it doesn't say we've evolved. It doesn't say we finally reached enlightenment. It doesn't say we've we finally pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. It says, but when the the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, salvation came. He saved us. It was outside of us. It was something he did to us. It was something God brought in when we were still sinners. We're foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lust, pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and despicable and hating one another. And we're not even crying out for help. It's not like we're in the swamp saying, save us, God. We're in the swamp saying, hey, you know, hang on a minute. Don't take us out of here. We like some of this swamp sin stuff that we've got going on here. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out, God. I know it's a mess. I know we're drowning, but we'll figure it out, God. Just hold your horses. And then God shows up with kindness and affection. Was it something God saw in us? We're a bunch of rebels. The whole thing starts with God. That's my point. This first point is just that salvation is God's initiative. It wasn't when we fixed it. It was when he showed up with mercy and kindness. That's when the whole thing starts. It all starts with God's love. God so loved the world that he gave. That's the whole point. While we're still sinners, Romans 5, 7 to 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The song we, we sing, if, we had, if he had not loved us first, we would refuse him still. God shows love to the unlovely. That's the point, isn't it? And, and that fixes the whole idea that, you know, if, if, um, if we look at someone and we just think, well, that person, that person, I mean, they are never going to seek God. Because look at them. They're busy enjoying their sin. They actually like their sin. Yes, so did you, right? That's the point. So did you. You're no different. They're blind. They just can't see it. I tried to share the gospel with them. And it was like water off a duck's back. It was like trying to show light to someone who, who doesn't have eyes. Well, yeah, well, that was you. <laughs> how, do you how do you get someone without eyes to see? Well, God has to show up and give them eyes, right, to start with. And that's the whole point, the initiative for salvation. It comes from God. Salvation is God's initiative. Um, we need God to come and fix our rebellion. Now, now, um, do, you, do you want that? Do you, do you want God to come and fix you? We're like people who are in the swamp, and we're, we're, we're saying from our swamp, but I like it here. I like some of the things that I've got here. I know it's a mess, but there's, there's sins, there's pleasures from sins that actually I'm attached to here. I'm never going to be saved. Now, now, my question is, do you want God to come and fix that? Do you want God to reach down into your life and change you at the heart, the rebellious, sin-loving part of you? Do you want that fixed? Listen, friend, that is the Holy Spirit stirring you. That is the Holy Spirit drawing you. There's plenty of people who don't want that fixed. And I'm saying to you, if that's you, the Holy Spirit is, is calling upon you today. And don't harden your heart. If, if today you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, what the Bible says. We used to sing an old hymn in, in my church that I love. The title is, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Wretched, Weak and Wounded by the Fall. Jesus ready stands to save you. Full of pity, love, and power, I think it says. It's, anyway, the, verse 3 says, Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness... He requireth 
is to feel your need of him. And you say, but I can't even have that. This he gives you. This he gives you. Tis the Spirit's rising beam. This is old-fashioned language, but it's saying, look, you start to feel your need of him. That's God giving you by the Spirit. He's drawing you. Is that encouraging to you, Christian? You want him, and you say, well, that's him making me want him because if you did not love me first, I would refuse you still. Praise the Lord. Salvation is God's initiative. Are you with me? This is good because I'd be lost if it wasn't true. Secondly, salvation is not earned. Verse 5, he saved us. He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness. You can't earn salvation. You just can't earn it. It's not achievable. Sorry. That's your default mindset, isn't it? Is you need to earn this. That's all of our default mindset. This is the human nature default setting. It's like you, you know, if you electrocuted us and our brains went back to default setting, you'd be like, I need to be saved by works. That would just be your factory setting. It was my setting. I mean, I, I, I know this painfully by experience. I came to church. I didn't mean to go to church. I went really to make fun and went along with, because I heard my brother was going, my parents were going to a church where the Bible was taught. They were saved. I didn't really want to go along. I went along. And I heard the gospel being preached. And as I heard the gospel being preached week in, week out, I just had to go back. I was like captivated. This is weird. This is not like anything I've ever heard before. This is true. And I, and I kept going back and hearing more. And as I heard more, I just came under more and more and more conviction of sin. I just came to see more and more and more of my own wretchedness. And then I started trying to repent. I was like, God, I looked around my room and it's like, I can't look anywhere without seeing something that I've stolen. I started thinking of all the lies that I'd told and told and and when I worked through the Ten Commandments, I couldn't think of one of them that I hadn't broken. I hadn't physically murdered anyone, but there was a lot of murder in this sinful heart of mine. But, but there you go. That's, that's the, the wretch. Now, what's this wretch trying to do? I've got to clean my... I've got to fix this. I've got to repent. I'm trying to go to God and call out to God for mercy. And I'm asking the question, but... But how do I know that I'm how do I know that I'm truly sincere? I've got to be sincere in my repentance. I've got to be a hundred percent sincere. But how sincere is sincere enough? How repentant is repentant enough? And actually, unknown to me, my default setting of I've got to be good enough to be accepted by God had been transferred to the idea of repentance. And I'm like, I'm trying to repent well enough so that God will look at my repentance and say, well done, Tom, you really repented well today. You can earn heaven. And I had no assurance. Maybe that's you. And one day a chap sat me down in church after church. He asked me the same question every week. Do you know the Lord yet, Tom? And I said to him for the first time, I said, no, I don't. I always used to just lie and say yes. And I said, no, and he sat me down and he walked me through Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2.8, when you get to Ephesians 2.9, he says, not by works, not by works. And it was like a light went on. It was like, then, then I can be saved because I'm, not, I'm trying and I'm not getting there. Romans 3.20 tells us the same thing. But for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Why is it like that? Why can't we be saved by works? Well, um, let me just, to answer that, give you a couple of questions in return. First question is, how good does a work have to be to be acceptable to God? That's a good question, isn't it? It's a very simple question, but it's got a very painful answer. Another question, what about all our sins? What about 
what we earn by our sins, is what I mean by that. How, how good do you need to be to be truly righteous? According to God's standard, any work to be truly righteous in his sight needs to be according to his standard, not according to our standard. We like to lower the standard and say, I did pretty well. I did better than her and I did better than him. Um, but God says, no, perfection, that's my standard. He sets it out for us very clearly. Jesus made it clear. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your might. So whatever good work you try to do that falls short of that standard of love for God is not going to be a good work in his sight, right? It's not going to be a good work done in righteousness. And we're talking about that as the standard, not whatever standard you invent. So... There's a problem there. Somebody needs to get up. It's your, it's your alarm ringing. Wake up, brother. Now, uh, God's verdict on it is, look, no one is righteous. This is Romans 3.20, isn't it? No one is righteous. And then in case you objected to that, he, he, he throws in, no, not one, not one person meets that standard. And yet, that's the typical teaching in religions, isn't it? The Quran says this, Surah 23, verse 103, but those whose scales are lighter will perish and abide in hell forever. That's Surah 23, verse 103, according to the Ahmed Ali translation. This is a picture of scales, isn't it? So you've got your good works, on one side, and God's obviously standard on the other, and if your good works don't out, uh, no, your bad works on the other side, sorry, and if your good works don't outweigh your bad works, if your good works are lighter, and so the scales tip in the favor of your bad works, you're stuffed, you're going to hell, that's the picture in the Quran. Well, uh, (laughs) what qualifies as a truly good work? Oh boy, Uh, we're in trouble, aren't we? The Egyptians had the same basic idea. They said that when you died in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they'd say your heart would be removed and weighed in the scales. And on the other side of the scales was the feather of truth. And if your heart was heavier than the feather of truth, you went to hell, basically. Because if your heart was weighed down by lies, by corruption, and so on, that was it. That was the balance. This is the balance. This is the scales of justice, according to the Egyptians and according to Islam. Um, The Roman Catholic Church is is basically the same idea. In the Reformation, the Reformers said, no, that we're justified by faith alone, Not faith that is alone, contradicting James 2, but faith alone, not faith plus works. And to counter that, to to kind of put back the idea that you have to have good works to qualify for heaven, this was the Council of Trent, Canons on Justification, Canon 9 says, if anyone saith that by faith alone the impious, that's the ungodly, is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification. In other words, your good works have to go along with faith in order to obtain, in order to achieve, in order to earn justification. And that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared or disposed by the movement of his own will. In other words, you've got to be the initiator in this whole business. This is the pronouncement of the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent. Let him be anathema. Let you be eternally condemned if you don't say that salvation is faith plus works. That's the Roman Catholic official doctrine. It's in the catechism. Hasn't changed. Well, actually, the Bible says very simply, very clearly, it's right here in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, he saved us. What does it say, the next three words? Say it with me. Not by works. Say it again. 
not by works. Now, please, would you just wake up tomorrow morning and say that to yourself? Because you, you're going go, to go to bed, and overnight, this weird thing happens, and you go back to factory settings, and you wake up in the morning, and you're a works mentality person again. And you need the gospel again, and this is the gospel. The good, the good news is it's not by works. Praise God. Otherwise, you and I are stuffed, right? We're going to hell because we don't have the good works that God wants, but we also have a whole load of other stuff that God says deserves death, the wages that, that sin pays. This is Romans 6.23, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. It's death. That's that's what we're earning. You want to talk about earning, that's what we deserve. Now, um, so we've got two facts, haven't we? The first fact is that salvation is God's initiative. The second fact is that the salvation is not by works, not by works. Now, thirdly, I don't know how far we're going to get today. We'll try. Salvation. Salvation is based on mercy. Mercy. He saved us, this is verse 5 still, not by works which we did in righteousness, but, what does it say? According to his mercy. Mercy is a good word, isn't it? If Elon Musk bumped into you in the street whilst you're standing next to a brand spanking new bright red Tesla, I don't know what Tesla models there are, but a good one. And if he asked you, do you like it? You like it? And you said, well, yeah. And he said, you can have it. What would you say? You say, well, yeah, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Now, what about if you happen to be a, a previous employee of Twitter until yesterday? What about if yesterday you left Twitter and on your Twitter profile you posted a whole load of really bad things about Elon Musk? What would you be saying now? You'd be going, ah, he doesn't know who I am. (laughs) Um, I need to get hold of this Tesla before he realizes just how much I have sinned against Elon Musk. Otherwise the deal is off, right? I mean, this is, this is, Just a little picture for you, but God does know who you are. What about if on your way out from Tesla headquarters, you'd walked down the side of Elon Musk's own car with a key? And you'd walked up the other side with a key as well. And it was all there on CCTV. You'd be saying, well, he he doesn't, he doesn't have, he hasn't seen what I did. But God has seen the CCTV of your life. God knows what you've done. So what is it when God offers you, not a Tesla, he offers you eternal life, salvation? What is it when he knows who you are and then he comes to you and he says, I'm I'm offering you salvation? This is mercy, isn't it? This is mercy. And let me just make it abundantly clear. You can't earn mercy, can you? That's a contradiction in terms, earning mercy. You can ask for mercy. You can beg for mercy. You can never deserve mercy. And according to this book, Salvation, this is our third fact, Salvation, is according, it's not by works, it's according to his mercy. Now, let's just back up and apply this for a second because we're talking about our relationship with rulers and authorities. And you're like, <laughs> I, don't, I just don't know what, how this affects me. Okay, let's just remember that we've been told to submit to and to show obedience to our rulers and authorities, right? And more than that, to be ready for every good work, to be kind, to be show perfect courtesy to all. I mean, this is, it's like we're supposed to be 
nice to people who are sometimes horrible, terrible, oppressive, abusive towards us. And, and you're saying you're supposed to be nice to them? Is this like Stockholm Syndrome? No. This is actually saying they are no, they're bad, yes, but they're no different from how I was before I was saved. You're also saying something more than that, aren't you? You're saying that, that actually all I des- ever deserved was hell, but God showed me mercy. I'm wretched. I was wretched. And God had pity upon me and showed me love despite knowing everything that I did. And now you go to pray for that person and what comes up in your heart? Oh, but God, they don't deserve it. Oh, they've been just rotten to me. How can I pray for them with a good heart? Well, this is how, isn't it? You, you, You have to remember, unlike the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18, you have to remember how much you've been forgiven, don't you? You have to remember how much mercy was shown to you. And when you do remember that, when you do think about the mercy shown to you, you can, you can pray for that wretch who's oppressive to you. Well, I'd love to give you the story. I, I, I didn't look it up and I wish I had now, but there's a story about a Japanese prison guard who beat to death at personally tortured and um, abused some prisoners of war and some of these people shared the gospel with him some of them losing their lives and but then after the war he, he ends up on trial and people shared the gospel with him and he was saved why would you go to someone like that to bring the gospel to them to see them saved when they've been, you'd want to see them go to hell, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, if you, if you thought they, they were different from you, but if you can look into the eyes of your Japanese prison guard, who's a torturer, a murderer, the most vile person on the planet as far as you're concerned, if you can look into his eyes with pity, knowing that he's lost, and that you're no different. You can pray for him. You can respond differently to him. You could even show kindness to him as you're told to. Look, this is, this is a revolutionary doctrine, isn't it? You could pray for someone. You could even love someone who is wretched. And you know what? When you did that, when you showed mercy and love to someone who was wretched... Who would you be like? You'd be like your father in heaven. You'd be shining the light of heaven into hell on earth, right? That's what those places are. But, the, but let, let me just say, Christian, that's what Christians have done throughout the history of Christianity. That's what we've been called upon to do is to love, to show love, to show mercy, to show kindness, to show compassion to people who are persecuting us, to people who hate us, to people who curse us. Jesus says what? Let's hear it. Bless, bless those who curse you, right? That's the gospel gospel message to us. We don't deserve it. Now, brother, sister, can I just be real again and go back to the factory reset problem that we have? You and I have a factory reset problem. We wake up in the morning and we've got a works mentality. We can start feeling, we can forget that it was mercy. We can start feeling, hey, my life is a lot cleaner now. I used to be like that, but now I'm like this. Um, God is, you know, God is starting, God has changed me. Those wretched, awful sinners, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with you people? Yeah, well, that's, that's you being going back to a works mentality. You can start looking at people who are abusive and and aggressive and cruel to you and instead of praying for them, instead of blessing them, you can start cursing them. You can start wishing them harm. You can start becoming one of those 
true hate preachers who, who, who don't want to say turn or burn even. They want to say just, you're going to burn. They want to say, you're going to hell, you wretched. You, you just hate God. You're going to hell. That's your problem. Instead of looking at people who hate God and saying, I was just like that. Oh, God, have mercy upon them. All right, so let's just remember the factory reset and remember we have to have this gospel ready on our tongues and ready in our prayers every day. Can I, can I just say as well, look, friend, if you're here today and you're thinking, what hope is there for me? Mercy. <laughs> this is good, isn't it? Because it, it, the, the greater the sin that you've committed, that you think God couldn't save me because of this in my life, I murdered my... Imagine filling in that blank. Imagine if you're that person sitting here today. The greater the sin you've committed, the, the more it shows God's mercy if he forgives you. Now, does God want to forgive? Well, actually, the history of every single person in this room and the history in the Bible is written large for us. Yes, there was a woman who came and wept at Jesus' feet. And, and she wept and she just broke open a bottle of perfume. She poured it over Jesus and it was weird. And it was really just an odd moment. And Jesus just took it. He's just sitting there. And this woman's weeping and drying her, dripping her tears on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair and pouring stuff on him. It's just weird. It's like, ugh. And there's another guy there who's going, ugh. So this guy was a prophet. He'd know that that woman's a sinner. You think Jesus didn't know she was a sinner? You know what Jesus said to that man, Simon? Something to say to you. And then he talked to Simon about sin. He said, it, if, you, if you're forgiven much, you love much. God is about forgiving much. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. So I just want to encourage you, friend, if you're sitting here thinking, well, how can I come to God? The only thing any of us can ask for is mercy. The only difference between you and that really good-looking person who you think is not such a bad sinner as you, maybe you need more mercy. <laughs> well, is God capable of giving you more mercy? Look, how did God pay for mercy? You say, what, what do you mean pay for mercy? Oh, I mean, God is a just God, right? And he has to punish sin. How did God pay for mercy? God sent his only son to a cross, to pay the price for sin so that he could show mercy to undeserving sinners like me and you, right? Is this good news? Jesus is God in the flesh. And yet, as God in the flesh, he bore the weight of God's wrath for sin on the cross so that you in all your wretchedness could go to God and say, I don't deserve it, I don't deserve it, but I need mercy, please forgive me, have mercy on me. You remember the tax collector in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee? How did the tax collector pray? Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know what God, Jesus said about that man? He said, that man went home justified before God, right in God's eyes. How? How? Because Jesus paid for his sin. Jesus took the penalty instead of him. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? So, so Christian, can I just encourage you with this thought? It's all about mercy, isn't it? And, and, and someone who's not saved yet, what do you need? You just need to go and beg for mercy. You need to beg for mercy with courage because Jesus died to, to give mercy. Jesus even prayed and gave mercy to the guy on the cross next to him who a few moments earlier had been hurling abuse at him. And then he was asking, 
Lord, have mercy upon me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. My prayer for you today, if you're here and you're saying, but I'm a wretched sinner, my prayer for you is that you'll ask for mercy and that you'll know that today Jesus has said that to you. You're going to paradise, not hell. Paradise because of Jesus' work on the cross. Father, we pray that as we um, begin to take in all that you have done in, in providing salvation for us, Lord, we beg you that you would, Lord, apply this to somebody's soul here today and enable them to know that they are saved and saved by what you have done, the initiative that you took, not by their works, but by your mercy. Oh, God, save, we pray. Oh, gracious God, have pity upon us, Lord, because we're so stupidly proud and stupidly quick to return to a works mentality and let go of our assurance that it's all by grace, it's all by mercy. Lord, help us to cling to it for ourselves, but also to cling to it for others and to pray and to be willing to submit and to do good to those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who despitefully use us. Lord, we pray it that we would be sons of our Father who is in heaven and that you would be pleased to use that to shine your light into the world around us. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.